Uh, welcome back students. So, in the previous lecture we have seen the ammonia recovery and also the ammonia synthesis loops. So, in this we also seen the how we can uh, remove the excess hydrogen in the form of a pressure swing absorption cycle. So, moving on after ammonia the important chemical which we all know is urea. So, urea as obvious as the name suggests it is a main fertilizer in our Indian context. So, we will see first the urea synthesis how it is synthesized and then what are the difficulties in the preparation of urea and what are the byproducts involved step by step. So, what we are going to cover is a brief background on uh, the urea synthesis, then the reactions and thermodynamics involved. So, the thermodynamics involved and the challenges in the design of urea process. So, the urea process is not that easy like uh, the basic equation as you know the reaction is the actually the synthesis uses ammonia and carbon dioxide. So, when they are mixed they are reacted they form the urea. So, but that is not easy because there are a number of reactions involved we will discuss them one by one. Then there are two manner in which it can be produced it is a once through process. So, nothing is recycled once through means it is nothing is recycled and then is the stripping process here it is recycled. So, one is one without recycle one is with recycle. Then what are the challenges? So, you know when you are producing some urea, so there are some uh, reactants also present. So, how to remove those reactants, how to remove the unconverted or how to remove the byproducts? Those are the challenges and one of the byproduct formation is biureate. So, this biureate formation if it is stays with urea, it is very detrimental to crops, it may damage the crops. So, that is we should avoid. So, how can we avoid as an engineer? We have to just tune the temperature or pressure or in the reaction condition. Then the corrosion because one of the intermediate compound which is formed is ammonium carbamate. This ammonium carbamate is very corrosive in nature. So, if it passes through your compressor pumps it will just damage them. So, that also we need to need that lesser time it should have in contact with those moving parts or the, the pipes or joints. Then finally, finishing process means uh, when you have urea, you have urea solution, but if you see in the our fields, the farmers usually use in the form of urea pellets. So, how the solution is converted to pellets, we will discuss that. Then also I will just discuss briefly the urea cycle. Urea cycle means uh, in our body also we are synthesizing urea because we have some ammonia due to the production of some certain enzymes. So, that ammonia is been converted to urea and then it is excreted from our human body primarily the organ will just do this liver. So, liver actually converts this ammonia to urea. So, these uh, small things also we will discuss as we go ahead. So, what is the background? So, it is known till uh, I mean 200 years back. So, 1828 this German chemist uh, Friedrich Wöhler they synthesized the urea for the first time from an organic compound is cyanic acid. So, cyanic acid is HCHON. So, cyanic acid and from an inorganic compound. So, you use an organic compound and an inorganic compound to produce an inorganic compound that is ammonia, okay. That is ammonia and cyanic acid are mixed and it forms the urea. So, it means, but nowadays this process is actually not useful. So, urea is now commercially produced in vast amounts from liquid ammonia and carbon dioxide, okay. Now, this liquid ammonia as you know, uh, a lot of emphasis is provided by our government of India because liquid ammonia it can use two purpose. Uh, the issue is here the state of ammonia. If it is a liquid state, it will remain as a liquid state at room temperature if you keep the pressure at 7 bar. So, 7 bar pressure and a room temperature it is very easy to transport. So, the transportation of this as a fuel is easier. So, government because is putting a lot of focus on this. Uh, liquid ammonia as a source of fuel because liquid ammonia can uh, disintegrate into nitrogen and hydrogen. Hydrogen obviously you know it is a hydrogen based economy, hydrogen is used as a fuel, okay. So, this is what it has been used for and it is giving mass focus. But if you want to uh, store at uh, atmospheric pressure, you have to go at minus 7 degrees Celsius. So, these conditions, this temperature pressure where you can keep it as liquid serves as a huge advantage. So, liquid ammonia thus serves two purpose. First is as a fuel nowadays and also now it is also used as I will see in this lecture it is used for the manufacture of urea. So, the raw materials here are combined and so these raw materials obviously cannot uh, combine at a normal state you have to combine at a very high pressure and temperature 
to form ammonium carbamate. So now this ammonium carbonate is an intermediate. So there are two steps. First is you combine ammonia and carbon dioxide to form ammonia carbonate and the next step you decompose ammonium carbonate to urea and water. So it means what have we studied till now? We have studied the source of raw materials. So now the source of raw materials as I told you, source of raw materials. So where does this come from? Source of raw materials for ammonia synthesis is right NH3. So ammonia synthesis you require nitrogen and hydrogen you get ammonia. So once you get ammonia then uh, in the ammonia synthesis loop you can get further you will get the ammonia as the main product. So in the entire ammonia synthesis loop this is the main product which we have already seen in the previous lecture and we will see in, in a way we can also see and use carbon dioxide as the byproduct. And this byproduct from ammonia synthesis loop can be used as a starting product for the manufacture of urea. So let us see the two reactions. The two reactions which I just now described are usually carried out simultaneously in a high pressure reactor. Okay. So urea's main use is as a fertilizer and it is classified as a non-toxic compound. So obviously you know it is a non-toxic because it is used as a fertilizer and most of the vegetables whichever you purchase it has some sort of we are given this urea as a part of fertilizer. Other applications are as cattle feed supplements so this urea can also be used as some fodder for the cattle and it is also used in the manufacture of resins, glues, solvents and some medicinal supplement. So, these are the uses of urea. So, that is why this urea compound production of urea is one of the key inorganic base material, okay. inorganic base chemical which actually uh, gauges a country's economic development. So, that is why this urea we should study and also observe its process. So, the formation now we let us see the reactions on thermodynamics. The formation of urea occurs through two uncatalyzed. So, there is no catalyst involved here. It is uncatalyzed reaction equilibrium reaction. So, there is a reversible as well as irreversible reaction. The first reaction is the formation of ammonia carbamate. So, what is the formation of ammonia carbamate? So, here you have ammonia reacting with carbon dioxide to reversibly to form H2NCOO ammonium carbamate it is. Ah, so, ammonium carbamate, carbamate means it is NH4, okay. So, this is ammonium So, whenever I refer to carbamate it means it is ammonium carbamate because there are no other compound with carbamate here. So, if I well I need to do some balancing. So, if you see there is nitrogen 2 times hydrogen is 6 times here. So, I need to put a 2 here. So, this reaction is pretty fast and it is also exothermic. So, delta H at 298 Kelvin is close to minus 159 kilojoule per mole. So, what are the key features? Reaction is exothermic, it is fast reaction is liquid at reaction condition. However, it solidifies at normal condition. So, this ammonia carbamate may solidify. So, ammonium carbamate combines at high pressure. So, it may combine at high pressure that is fine. If it combines it is fine, but it should not decompose. So, your pressure you need to tweak. So, if you have a low pressure it will just decompose in your starting material and then that then that is of no use because you are again getting ammonium CO2. So, the pressure has to be reduced in such a manner that the unconverted products sorry the unconverted reactants are released as soon as possible. Okay. So, that is what to avoid dissociation of carbonate back into ammonia and carbon dioxide reaction is thus always operated above 130 bar. So, this entire reaction is carried out at a very high pressure of 130 bar. The second reaction dehydration. So, it loses water from the ammonium carbonate. So, what is that reaction? So, you have the H2N 
ammonium carbamate this is the ammonium carbamate. So, it will be a slow reaction slow reversible reaction. So, it will give you this is the endothermic reaction. So, the delta H at 298 is close to around 31.4 kilo joule per mole ok. So, it is a slow reaction and so this is your urea. So, ammonium carbonate so ammonium carbonate is converted to urea and water. So, this is the so it is a slow reaction another one is the fast reaction. So, overall it is exothermic because if you add up this delta H it will be negative. So, even though second reaction is endothermic, so we say the overall reaction is exothermic. So, the carbamate to urea conversion is much slower than the carbamate formation. So, you need to you know, so one is slow, one is fast. So, you need to tailor the residence time within the components in the reactor. That is how you could go about as an engineer, you just tailor the residence time. So, moving ahead. So, what have we learned till now? Both reactions are function of temperature. Now, pressure we have fixed 130 bar. What are the temperature? It is a function of temperature. It is seen the conversion is the highest at this 450 to 480 Kelvin. Now, the ammonia and CO2. So, if you see the stoichiometric 2 moles of ammonia is reacting with 1 mole of CO2. Okay. So, it means that can I use a higher ratio, but till what extent? so that it does not decrease the yield. So, the, the ratio they found out is obviously, if you take a higher ratio, you will have more and more conversion above the stoichiometry, but uh, usually they keep it between 3 to 5 moles of ammonia as compared to moles of CO2. This actually is seen to give the maximum yield of urea, but as I told you ratio greater than 5, it can reduce the yield. So, for sufficient high reaction rate, what they have said? 420 Kelvin. Now, there are difference if you see I have studied I mean I have told you 450 Kelvin here, but here it is 420. Now, it is by thermodynamics it says you have this temperature range, but from reaction kinetics you say 420 Kelvin is the acceptable rate of reaction. So, you have a molar ratio, you have the temperature and the pressure we know 130 bar. So, you have got all the three the concentration, temperature, pressure is known. Okay. So, this is economical, these particular conditions are economical and feasible. So, it is seen that the conversion is between 50 to 75 percent. So, now let us see what are the challenges involved. Now, the challenges primarily uh, evolve from the fact that the carbamate removal. Now, when you are forming urea, you will also have the carbamate with it because the other reaction is slow and that one is fast. So, it may be possible that you have carbamate into the urea solution. Now, how to strip that carbamate? Because I told you this carbamate will again decompose and into ammonia and carbon dioxide and overall this carbamate is very corrosive. So, you should not keep it in the reactor, it should be minimum as possible. So, overall if I want to draw this, so what you are having is finally, you have a, you have a reactor here working, you have a reactor you have ammonia, you have carbon dioxide, CO2. So, what you are getting the products now let us see what is the complex products you are getting. You will be having ammonia, you will be having water from the second reaction, you will have in urea, you will be having carbamate. Okay. So, it means you will have so many products. So, ammonia and H2O then SO2 also you will be having CO2. So, all this needs to be very uh, tailored so that you only get uh, this urea lower the quantity of carbamate higher the quantity of urea. So, it means that the reactor effluent the one which is coming out always contains a significant amount of carbamate at equilibrium. Okay? It is necessary to separate carbamate from the urea solution because of the reasons just now I have discussed. So, to separate this carbamate, it is decomposed. When I say it is decomposed, 
So, it means that this reaction I should do. So, if we are not able to uh, convert it, so this reaction I should be able to do. Decompose means what? Decompose means I have to produce carbon dioxide and ammonia. This is mean by decomposition. So, that these again these are taken out and fed to the reactor as the starting point. Provided now, this is only possible provided when when we have efficient handling of the unconverted. Okay, you can do, you can tailor the temperature and pressure, but then you will have CO2 NH3. What will you do? Because this, if you have to recycle, you have to recycle at a very high pressure. And if you recycle at a very high pressure, then they may combine and they may combine and form crystals of carbamate, which is again not required. So, it means we have to take care of this factor. The second factor is minimization of water concentration. So, you should lower the amount of water in urea solution. For example, if you have a urea which is having 60 percent or 70 percent is good, 80 percent is very good. But if you have 30 percent of urea solution, it means 70 percent water is there. So, you have to remove them by vacuum or by, uh, how do you remove it? You, I mean you can sparge this solution, what they call is in the prilling tower. So, actually they will just, the water will evaporate. So, you require a lot of heat, so that also you should take care. So, you should not get more, carbamate should be decomposed, but in a manner you should not produce more amount of water. So, going through the challenges in the design of urea process, the once through process, in a once through process the carbamate was decomposed by reducing the pressure. So, what you do is you get the effluents, you get the effluents, reduce the pressure because it is 130 bar, reduce it, it will flash. So, what they do? They do not reduce it from 130 bar to 1 bar directly. So, they do it in steps. Let us say from 130 to 30 bar, then 30 to 10, 10 to 1. So, you do it slowly. Uh, so, that you get sufficient amount of the products or the you can minimize the impurities or the gas as much as possible. And then you get the pure urea solution. Okay, That is the way they do it actually. That is why I have written here expansion valve. So, the unconverted, if you do a expansion valve, the unconverted ammonia can be easily neutralized. So, if you have the, um, obviously, if you are flashing, you will have light ends coming out, light ends will have ammonia and CO2. And now, this ammonia can be neutralized if you add nitric acid. Nitric acid will react with ammonia to form ammonium nitride and ammonium nitride is also a source of fertilizer, that is fine. But the issue is not the process, but of the economics. So, the economics dictates that this plant then will become heavily dependent on the co-products. So, we have to focus more on how to remove or minimize the formation of co-products rather than to produce the main product. So, that is what uh, is stops the once through process. So, let us see the another one the recycle type or the stripping process. The stripping process is also called as total recycle process. In this all of the unconverted, now you are getting unconverted ammonia and CO2, they will be recycled back they will be recycled back to the urea reactor. So, but you cannot recycle like that, you have to recycle at a certain pressure. So, the recompression, it should be recompressed, the ammonia CO2 mixture should be re recycled, recompressed, but it should not be recompressed in such an extent that it will form carbamate. So, that is what in the third point I have mentioned, there is a chance of combination of ammonia and carbon dioxide. So, it may form liquid carbamate droplets. Or in mere solid, if the temperature is fine, it may form nucleation, it will form solid crystals at lower temperature. So, they can damage the compressor. If you want to compress this total gas and send it to the reactor, it may damage. So, that is also you should take care. So, let us see the once through process. So, in the once through process, what you have is a urea reactor, a set of urea reactor, then a set of carbamate decomposers. So, you have a urea reactor where the main reaction is happening, then a carbamate decomposer where the pressure is reduced. I will draw two such decomposer, it can be more also because you reduce it slowly and slowly. So, first you have the reactor, okay. this is a reactor, so you compress it, you send the ammonia. and you also compress. So, I make the sign of the pump where you are compressing this 
and send both of them together here. Okay. CO2 and ammonia is compressed. So, what are the temperature and pressure? As I told you, 400 and near about 450 Kelvin for a one cycle process and 130 bar. And the composition I already told you it is around to close to 3 to 5 moles of ammonia per mole of CO2. Now, when the effluents comes out here, so nothing is coming down, it is a reactor. So, I will write here urea reactor. In this urea reactor, actually, both the reaction happens, first reaction, second reaction. Now, what do you do? The products come, you expand it. This is a expansion valve, okay. You expand it and send it to one first set of carbamate decomposer. So, in this carbamate decomposer, which is something like this, so you pass steam through it. Okay, you pass steam. So, what you are getting? You are flashing it. So, now from 130 bar, I will keep the pressure close to 20 bar. So, it will flash, you will have a liquid and a solid phase. So, liquid phase and solid phase and gas phase, whatever. So, what you are getting at the top is some product which will be primarily be combined with other carbamate decomposers. I will work that later. Okay. Now, again, effluent or the remaining the gases are coming on the top the liquid solution coming down again it is expanded pressure reduction so if it expanded it goes here goes to the second set of the carbamate condenser okay again steam is sent to take away the heat so, what you have is urea solution finally here. I would write pure urea solution or urea solution for finishing. So, finishing means usually in the market you will not get such urea solution, you will get beads of urea pellets. So, for pellets you go for finishing so that I am not showing here. So, now you make it till 1 bar. Now, see the pressure is reduced from 130 to 20 to 10 bar, 1 bar. Again, you will have some products coming out here. So, what you are finally getting is you have ammonia here as the unconverted, you have carbon dioxide here, you have H2O here. Okay. So, it does not allow to form carbamate in this case. So, you are taking out the reactant for the formation whatever for it is useful for the formation of carbamate from the carbamate condensers which are two here carbamate decomposers. Okay. So, these are some products which are coming out. So, this is the way the ones through urea process is designed. Now, let us see the recycle process. So, in this what you do is you strip the instead of flashing you strip the components unconverted gases after the reactor effluents I mean the reaction is happening in the main reactor the effluents are coming and going and entering a stripper in this stripper only what you do you use carbon dioxide to strip the ammonia and carbon dioxide both together that is the way they do it so that you do not form carbamate. So, it means in conventional urea process we have seen you have a pressure reduction and a heating which can help in the carbamate decomposition, but it can also be achieved the carbamate decomposition can also be achieved by stripping either. So, it is something like that uh, in the first reaction CO2 and H2 are reactant. So, if you are uh, stripping the reactant itself then how will be carbamate be forming? So, that is the way. So, I mean you are putting only the forward reaction. So, there is no backward reaction happening. So, let us uh, draw the flow sheet. I will write the basic block diagram. So, what you have is a uh, you have the heart of the process as the urea reactor. Okay. Likewise, you have a carbamate condenser.
So, carbamate condenser means where ammonia and carbon dioxide combines or condenses to form carbamate. Okay. So, you have a carbamate condenser, you have a urea reactor. Now, what you do is after the urea reactor is uh, have reacted, so what you have is the gases effluent along with the product that is you will have what are the products you can have here NH3, you will have water because urea is already produced, you will have urea and you will also have carbamate because not all has been, these are the products. So, you send them to a stripper. you send it to a stripper. So, you get final you will get urea solution that is our objective, but how to do it? What you do is you send as a stripping agent, this stripping agent is carbon dioxide. So, CO2 is somehow soluble in, so it makes ammonia soluble in CO2 phase and uh, so obviously, if you are taking out one of the component or the first reaction. So, the carbamate formation becomes less and less. Okay. So, it means what you do is you strip out and you send this mixture. So, here suppose ammonia is entering. So, you are sending this mixture back to this position both ammonia and CO2. So, you are sending ammonia and CO2. So, it is stripping ammonia and CO2 from the stripper and sending it back to the initial part. So, this is what they do a total recycle or you have a stripper. For total recycle or stripping system means the same. So, it is stripping off the ammonia and carbon dioxide away and keeping it and adding into the starting point of the carbamate condenser. Okay. So, let us see the summarize, let us summarize what we have studied. So, the stripping process for urea production how does it actually follow? The CO2 contacts with the effluent in the stripper which operates at the same pressure as the reactor. So, the stripper and the reactor both are operating the same pressure. So, there is no flash operation here. Okay. The gases leaving the stripper are sent. So, what are the gases? Gases means carbon dioxide is making the ammonia gas to be soluble. So, it is taking ammonia gas along with carbon dioxide to send to the carbamate condenser where partly condensation of ammonia carbamate occurs. So, what are the advantages of this stripping process? So, unconverted reactants are mainly recycled in gas phase. So, it means when you are actually taking these two gases and recycling, you are doing it in a gas phase, not a liquid phase. Because in a liquid phase, carbamate composition is highly possible. So, it is easy to maintain pressure. The recycle stream is easier, it is a gas phase and it also eliminates the excess water to the reactor. Okay. Whatever water is generated, it also helps because uh, you will only have the forward reaction, the carbamate decomposition reaction. And the stripping operation operates at lower, this is another important point, it operates at a lower ammonia and CO2 ratio, so that the chances of the converting into carbamate is the least. Okay. So, these are the summary for the stripping process. So, in the stripping process, stripping since uh, stripping is a very major uh, component for this urea uh, production, so several companies have put in their research and development efforts. So, how the stripper should be made and what are the integral part of the process, what are if there is any mass transfer restriction. So, for that the STEMI carbon they have developed a stripper. So, that stripper is been used in the total recycle process just now which I have discussed. So, let me make the STEMI carbon recycle process the stripper. So, for this what you have is you have a stripper something like this. So, you have a part where the gases are entering, the reactor effluents are entering and entering into the stripper and uh, again some gases which are exiting. So, after absorption by carbon dioxide it has to exit also. So, the exit route is here. 
of the gases for recycling okay so it is something like this you have So, this is the degassed urea solution, this is the final product, degassed urea solution. Okay. So, here you allow carbon dioxide to enter. So, you know this is some support and here you have a, you can say it is a gas distributor, it has to bubble through. Okay. Now, obviously, steam will be entering so as to take the heat. And here you take the condensate after because you need to heat also for effective mass transfer. Now, the heart of the process here, if you see, it is um, uh, something like. So, you will have a tube shell side and a tube side. So, these are the tubes which are inside the cell side and then the reactor effluent actually will enter through this reactor effluent so effluent enters here so actually it will fall on here and then there is a liquid distributor. So, this is your liquid liquid distributor and the demister will be there. You know the function of demister. Demister is to not to allow any solid particle pass through. Okay. Only it will allow the gas molecules to pass through. So, finally, you are absorbing ammonia from the solution of reactor effluent. So, this ammonia and CO2 are recycled in a certain ratio. Okay. So, now this is something like a falling type of heat exchanger. So, this exchanger is our falling type. So, what is this falling type of heat exchanger means? If I want to, let us say, if I want to draw this in detail, it will be something like this. So, let us suppose these are uh, you know so these are liquid phase okay so liquid if you see liquids they will reactor effluent is coming here entering here okay so liquids are falling downwards and gases like co2 here are going upwards so, you have a gas phase and a liquid phase in contact with each other. Okay. So, that is what it is called a heat, these are the heat exchange tubes. So, this is where what where this tamicarbon has designed this heat exchange tube and it is in operation in all of the urea stripping process. So, this is a heat exchange tube. This is exactly the uh, R&D innovation they did with this uh, heat exchanger tubes. Okay. The steam will take away the heat. So, it will pass through the shell side. So, in the tube you will have the gas. Uh, so, the liquid will coming through the liquid, it will flow through the tube and gas will pass in between. So, it will be a falling type of heat exchanger. So, then let us see what are the key points for this particular reactor. Let us combine this. The, so, what we can see is the stripper in the stamicarbon urea process is a falling flim type shell and tube heat exchanger. Okay. The reactor effluent flows downwards as a thin flame across the inner wall. So, in the tube itself, you have a liquid flame falling downwards and the gas flowing upwards. The gas is the carbon dioxide which enters the tubes at the bottom, counter current to the effluent. Steam in shell side of the heat exchanger is used as external heating medium for the tubes. So, in the shell side, you see I have entered steam through it just to take away the heat. 
So, the unconverted ammonia is stripped from the solution resulting in the decomposition of most of the ammonium carbamate. So, it means we have achieved that process where we are decomposing the ammonium carbonate and making it allowing it to form this urea and water. This is the stemicarbon CO2 process. Now, another innovation or I mean say this one is maybe process identification for the production of urea is the pool reactor. Now, what it does is the pool reactor, so uh, it will conduct both the reactions in one of the reactor itself. So, there will be a vigorous agitation. So, let me make the first the drawing of the pool reactor, then you will understand. So, it is something like this. Okay. So, ammonia will be fed here. And so, the stripper of gases, so stripper of gas means whatever the product I have stripped off from the stripper, stripper of gases. Okay. So, here you will have a pool, so these are the baffles. So, if you see these are the pool of the liquid, in order to take out the heat you have this steam as outlet and boiler feed water. So, BFW means boiler feed water. as the inlet and steam as the outlet. Now, here you have the similar uh, this uh, stripper. So, stripper is same what we discussed just now. Okay. So, now the urea or the carbamate solution is just as the previous I mean is sent here. The urea So, now instead of putting it separately ammonia and carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide here it used as a feed as well as a stripping agent. Okay. So, uh, again you will have a steam out here, steam out in. So, it will a steam uh, the you have boiler feed water entering here. I'm sorry, this is because we need to so steam in and steam out. Then uh, what it is you have a urea solution at the end. So, the entire process what it does is so the exothermic reaction which is happening, okay, the first reaction, the heat of the exothermicity from the combination of ammonia and carbon dioxide is taken up by the next reaction which is slow, which is slow means the reaction which is decomposition of carbamate. So, it is you reduce one inventory, so you are combining both the reaction in one unit and then when the urea or carbamate solution is made or it is formed, it is sent to the stripper. The stripper operates in a similar manner what we have discussed, it may be a stemic carbon stripper, you use carbon dioxide strip of the ammonia gas. So, the both the stripper of gases as well as the ammonia as the feed is sent. So, there is lot of mixing here. So, it means the heat of condensation, okay. the heat of condensation from the first reaction is used to decompose the ammonium carbamate in the second reaction. So, this is called a pool reactor. So, you have a pool of liquid here. So, there is adequate agitation to be made, the adequate mixing and the reaction takes place in the liquid phase. Okay. So, let us see what are the advantages of such a pool reactor. So, this is the newly developed reactor system with reduced investments called a pool reactor. The pool reactor combines the carbamate formation and its dehydration in a single vessel. That is the importance. You combine both the carbamate formation and dehydration in a single vessel. The continuous agitation of gases leaving the stripper. So, as the gases are entering in the pool reactor, a continuous agitation is going on. And the ammonia feed in the pool reactor, so the gases means what? The gases from the stripper as well as ammonia as the feed. They will provide better heat and mass transfer as compared to falling flame condenser. So, pool reactor provide longer residence time. 
So pool reactors shall provide longer residence time of liquid phase. So when the liquid phase is there, it means longer residence time. Longer residence time means more conversion or more decomposition of the carbamate. So it will allow the quick conversion of urea from the carbamate. So it means that a heat of condensation can now be used for the endothermic urea forming reaction as well as for the raising steam in the tube bundle. The tube bundle means the amino acid is present in the stripper. So, it casts the amount of heat is used for the second reaction as well as to provide heat in the stripper. So, that is what you have a process intensification example. This is an example of a process intensification. Okay. Now, what are the challenges in product handling? So, as I told you, the biggest challenge is the bariot formation. The bariot is the undesirable side product formed during urea synthesis. So, it is detrimental to crops and toxic to animals. So, bariot formation also occurs during the production of granular urea or it is called as prilling. So, what happens in this bariot formation? The two molecules of urea are combined to form a bariot with the release of ammonia molecules. So, the reaction proceeds in this manner. So, you have two molecules of urea. So, it is CONH2 and so if I write here. two molecules of urea they are combining to form biureate so it means CONH so it means uh, nothing but CONH2 group is replacing one of the hydrogen of urea so urea and this is biureate so you have and with a release of ammonia so, this is slightly endothermic, this is endothermic reaction. So, if it means what? If your temperature falls down, then this reaction may occur. That is why I have written the increased temperature accelerates the decomposition of urea to biureate, sometimes also triureate. So, maybe instead of CONH2, both the hydrogen gets replaced by a CONH2 group. So, it will be CONH2 whole twice NCONH2 that is also detrimental. So, in order to avoid this reaction in the downstream process, ammonia is removed from the urea solution which we have seen how it is done. We should see why it is happening because if you are taking one way we are stripping off ammonia, then it will create driving force because if it is ammonia is stripped off, you have only urea here. So, if it is urea and the temperature is favorable, it may form bioreate. So, they avoid the formation of bioreate temperature must be kept just above the melting point of pyrate and with a minimum residence time. So, you keep the temperature just above the melting point of the pyrate and keep the residence time low for a few seconds. So, these are the two things you should take care in order to avoid the formation of pyrate. So, what are the challenges I so, have seen in product handling? The corrosion is one of the biggest challenge. The urea solution containing ammonium carbamate is highly corrosive. Some measures, what are the measures to remove this corrosion? In the construction materials, a good choice of construction materials like stainless steel reactors. You can add oxygen with the feed. So, what happens if you add oxygen with the feed? It will form a metallic coating on the reactor. So, it form a metallic oxide coating which will protect it from corrosion. Minimal exposure of materials to the corrosive carbamate solution. So, it means even though we make everything, we make the material of construction, everything to be according to our plan, but still we should avoid the carbamate solution exposure to be minimum. So, the stripping process should be preferred over a complete recycle process. So, instead of complete cycle, we should always strip the solution like we have seen for the stemic carbon process. So, minimum temperature and pressure conditions with excess ammonia are these criteria which are desirable to reduce corrosion rates. Some of the methods they have used is high cost silver lining or aluminum alloys are used with the construction material. So, these are another way to reduce the corrosion process. So, now let us see how the finishing process is done. In the finishing process, what you do is that you have the once suppose you have the urea solution coming. Okay. So, it is stored in a so urea solution let us suppose it is stored in a tanker then you release the heat from it you release the heat 
cool it down. Then what you do is you put it in the vacuum evaporator. Okay, this is the put it in the vacuum evaporator. So it means uh, the conditions should be less than one bar, obviously. So what you have is at the lower end, the bottom product you will have primarily. 99 percent molten urea then what you do is you send this to a prilling tower now when you send it to a prilling tower it means prilling means what uh, you mix it with air you have cooling air means you are cooling it through air so prilling tower is something like this cooling air is sent at the bottom and your feed is sent at the top and it is you know it is sparged like this manner so air is released from here the hot air so if you take out the air so what you have is they will form urea granules urea granules so, in this it is coming less than 1 percent of biorate will be there in this urea. So, when you form this urea granules, obviously there is no chance of formation of biorate because you are taking the urea as 99 percent. So, you do not have any other compound where this may you no know, go back. So, you are leading the chance also. So, this is what you call as the prilling tower. So, in this case you are making the urea granules which can be easily be transported. This is the way urea is sent. So, this is the prilling process. So, let us again summarize what we read from the prilling process. Urea solution from primarily once through process if it is not a total recycled process is primarily for those process so let us say from once through process contains about 70 to 87 percent urea that can be used directly for nitrogen fertilizer suspension. Urea solution can be concentrated just now we have seen by evaporation or crystallization for the preparation of granular fertilizer because concentrated solution uh, may not have much use you prepare the granulated solution. So, concentrated urea such as prills or granules can be shipped, stored and used more economically than in solution that is the advantage. Solid form of urea is more stable and have less likely biorate formation that is the reason you make it in solid form. You make it in uh, small pellets, it is easy transport, no biorate formation is possible. The very fine dust is, but the only issue is a very fine dust is formed during the finishing process from the top of the tower because if you recall in the prilling tower the air is taken out, it may have some fine dust particles which is not at all good for environment. So, you should keep that in mind, you should measure what are these coming out. So, that dust should be, it should be as low as possible. Now, moving ahead. So, now let us also discuss the final concluding part that is the urea cycle that is the amino acid to urea. So, in all mammals urea is the primary nitrogenous waste. So, whatever we eat, so we have the urea also excreting from our body, so including us. So, primary nitrogenous waste from during the metabolic breakdown of proteins. So, in the course of the breakdown of proteins, the amino groups, so there are because proteins are obviously broke down, when it is broken they are converted to ammonia. So, we have several proteins like ATP, ADB all this, they are converted to ammonia which is toxic to the body and thus it must be converted to urea by the liver. The liver's enzymes, the liver's enzymes will then convert the ammonia and CO2 because we are also part of CO2 we also have in our lungs. So, some of them are being used. So, they will convert the ammonia produced and with carbon dioxide into urea which is then passes through kidney and finally flushed out with urine. So, if you recall uh, there is uh, in the blood test if you do for a you know a kidney function test they ask for certain proteins and also urea. So, in the urea concentration you also measure. Uh, so, the in a start urea sometimes they measure these components called creatinine and 
uh, uric acid ok. So, those things also are used to get an indirect measurement of how much of urea is there in your kidney, is it flushing out, is the urea been secreted or it is uh, getting out from the body. So, that is why for a good uh, functioning of kidney you always measure these two creatinine and urea in the blood. So, the overall reaction if I want to make it is something like this which happens. So, ammonia which is from the proteins combines with carbon dioxide and there is an enzyme called as aspartate. I will not go into the details of this uh, enzymes aspartate which is present in the liver. It forms a re reversible reaction urea and another protein it forms fumarate ok. So, aspartate is a salt of an alpha amino acid or aspartic acid that is used in the biosynthesis of the proteins. So, aspartate is already present. So, and fumarate is, is an intermediate for other linked biochemical cycle, ok. So, with this we actually come to the end of this lecture. So, you should follow our regular textbook, Maulin's book where the entire process for urea synthesis is discussed. And also you should go back to one of the new with this book we have already followed Dryden's book where urea and its prelink tower is given and uh, some more data for the urea cycle in human beings is found and can be found from this particular link. Thank you. Mm -hmm.